All right, folks. Well, we're going to go ahead and get started in the interest of time to make sure we have enough uh, space to cover all the questions we might have and any questions uh, you want to cover in, in all the content of the presentation. Uh, my name is Jesse Singleton. I'm the Assistant Director for Student Support at the Graduate School. I want to say hello to our folks joining us digitally, and then I'm going to actually go off camera uh, as I present to the room. It's a bit distracting for actually the folks online. So I want to say hello to you all, and then I'll go off camera. And hello to a lot of folks who are joining us in the room today. Uh, we are simulcasting the uh, workshop both online and in person. Um, for our folks who are online for us, Edgar Monroy, our, assist, our graduate assistant for the graduate school, is assisting and can help out if you have questions. You can feel free to post this in the chat. If we're having issues with technology, something doesn't seem to be working correctly, post it in the chat and he'll make sure that I know about it and make sure we get what we need. Um, but we have pretty good success with the technology so far in this space, but hopefully we're okay. Um, but just know that you have somebody in the digital space looking out for you today as we present. Again, my name is Jesse Singleton. I am the Assistant Director for Student Support at the Graduate School. I'm really excited you all come to our workshop session on time management today. Hopefully we find some uh, good tips and tricks that could help you uh, work on and develop that skill. Uh, if you're here, that means that uh, as you've been going through your graduate school experience, and you've probably encountered some new responsibilities, new tasks, uh, things you may have done in the past with time management just aren't working as well as you'd like, or you just want to develop this skill and really uh, reach an excellent level of it. I'm glad you could be here to have that conversation today. Um, so I'm really looking forward to that. As we get started, just a, a quick plug for the professional development sessions that we have for the semester. And so this is the list of everything we've got going on. I know it's a bit small for our folks in the room to read, but just to let you know, we do have things happening pretty consistently throughout the semester that we invite you to come and attend. We send those out via email uh, for invites and also post on our social media. So if you're interested in any of these things, please let us, uh, please feel free to attend, register and come check them out. Um, next week, we actually have a very busy week uh, where we will have a funding workshop, a leadership development workshop, an after hours presentation on conflict management, um, a free MT practice session, uh, and a writing retreat. So uh, there's a lot going on on the 19th, 20th, and 21st. I um, know we've got things out there that you might find interesting. So keep an eye on your email for those things. I'm actually on Thursday going to send out instead of uh, a uh, individual invites for all the events because we have so much going on coming up in that short time. We're going to send a digest. We'll have all those opportunities listed so you can take part in that. Look out for that email on Thursday. So just an overview of what we'll be covering today. Um, we are going to start off by talking about work-life balance and work-life integration. Then we're going to talk about prioritization strategies uh, that you can use to uh, reach uh, your goals. Really kind of figuring out what should I be working on, answering that question. Then we'll talk about time management techniques really figuring out how do you use the time while you're working. We're going to spend just a short amount of time on productivity tools, identifying what can help you be successful. And then we're talking about stress management, uh, which seems like it's a bit out of character for the rest of this presentation. But as I'll argue at the end, if you're at high points of stress, it's going to be really hard to manage your time effectively or to lean on the prioritization tools that you have when you're at high points of stress. So knocking that out first, is going to help you be more successful overall. And we know that time can be stressful. So we're going to talk about that. A quick peek at the chat and make sure everything's okay. All right, we're good. Thank you for the hellos. And it's good to see everyone uh, digitally. So thanks for that. All right. So first, what is work-life balance? Um, and so for our folks in the room, when I say work-life balance, what comes to mind for you? Folks in the chat, you can feel free to shout this out in the chat as well. So you're addressing to what you do here versus what you do in your free time and your life. Right? Yeah. What you do in, in your academic life and what you do everywhere else, how you relax. What else? When we say work-life balance. And when I say work-life balance, uh, I consider, you know, your job to be, you know, a student, right? And sometimes your job is being a student and also like a TA, you know, an actual job. But when we talk about this, your academics and this, this core becomes part of your job, right? 
So when we say work life balance, what how do we define that? It's a good example. Anything else? Oh, I'd also like to mention like personal maintenance because there's so mm -hmm. much time I, that I do quote unquote off the clock that really isn't leisure time. It's not relaxing, but it's not work either. Yeah. All the other things you have to do in order to, I mean, personal maintenance, you have to do yeah. laundry, uh -huh. uh, sleeping, you know, things you have to balance uh, uh -huh. in what you do, right? Uh, we hear a lot about work-life balance, uh, you know, again, in the professional field or an academic field and talking about how can you achieve this successful work-life balance? And it can feel a little bit like uh, the gentleman here in the graphic where they're on this teeter-totter trying to get these two things to balance appropriately. And this is inherently stressful, right? The idea that you can have a somewhat 50-50 split or feel in balance with these large responsibilities. Um, more often than not, I have folks talking about work-life balance being a stress point, something they feel is aspirational that they can't achieve. They look at others that they see kind of doing really well and assume their balance must be great uh, and mine is not. And that gives us these feelings of inadequacy, right? When in reality is the, problem, the person you look to and see as them balancing things really well is probably what I describe as a duck on the water, right? When you see a duck, they're just floating along. Everything seems great. What we don't see about the duck is their legs just kicking away as fast as possible, trying to keep them afloat, right? And we assume that duck is just cruising along, right? I'm gonna start off the presentation by saying, I like to take the concept of work-life balance and chuck it out the window as something that you need to try and achieve. Because I feel like it's an artificial construct that we kind of put our attention to this idea of, I need to achieve work-life balance, right? The scales are even, and that's where I'll be successful. Um, it's an aspiration that's almost impossible to achieve, and it creates more stress for us. And so I like to take that and just chuck it out the window. Now, I'm a person that believes that you know, the language we use really matters for our own selves and how we approach the world. And sometimes just changing the way we refer to something can powerfully change how we interact with something. And so instead of thinking about work-life balance, what I prefer to think about is work-life integration, right? So you can think of this as your, if you have another job that you do in addition to being a student, how that work integrates with your academic life and integrates with your personal life. Uh, or it can be if your academics is your job right now, how does that academic life integrate with the rest of your life? When you change the frame from thinking about this balance, this artificial balance you need to achieve to how do these things integrate together, it can change your overall perception of those things. And it goes from a potentially stressful thing that you're trying to aspire to, that other people seem to do better than you, to something that is achievable, that is focused on you as an individual and how you make that work, right? So when you're working towards work-life integration, you're focusing less on the idea of work time and personal time, and more about what is the best time for a task. Now, we don't always have 100% control over this, right? If you're a TA, when you teach a class is dictated by the course schedule. But with work-life integration, you try to find as best as you can, what is the best time for you to do something and do it that time. Daily activities are a part of a whole. They're not compartmentalized. We don't put things into discrete boxes as this is my academic work and now I'm stepping out of that and now I'm a person doing personal things. Uh, we're not as fragmented there, right? And we're gonna talk about time blocking and how that's useful, right? Um, but to me, that's not the same thing as compartmentalization. Uh, it allows us to see ourselves as a whole. Uh, it also minimizes the sense that we have these competing responsibilities and it puts them together, right? Where we can find overlap in our responsibilities uh, can be really healthy for us. The example I've used that I've found in my life is I'm a, a full-time working professional. I'm also a father of three. And so when I am, it's possible for me to do so, I bring my kids to after hours events that I have to work on campus, right? It's no longer a, comp a competition between my work self and my identity as a father. My kids are part of my world. They come in, they get to interact and they get to see what's happening, right? So I'm doing both at the same time in a positive way. And so to find those ways that how can you integrate what you're doing, right? Maybe that's 
talking with and finding ways to work remotely on something versus on campus, whether that's work responsibilities like a TA, GA, RA, um, and then being able to also step away from that to do laundry or take care of a task at home, right? Or it's about finding the best time for me to actually work on my dissertation is actually in the evening. So I focus on some of the personal maintenance things during the day, right? I break out of the nine to five. So I like us to frame this at the start from, let's look at work-life integration first. Get away from the negative concept of, I have to have this balance and feel like I'm 50-50, right? Because we also have to acknowledge that there are going to be times that despite our best efforts, it is never gonna be 50-50. There are times where it is a high volume period where I'm gonna to need to devote more of my time to that academic life than somewhere else. And that's a sacrifice I have to make for that week, that weekend, that day, because there's something large happening, right? Uh, there is some kind of orientation program that takes an entire day. I have to go and do that, right? Um, I'm devoting an entire Friday to going to the writing retreat for the graduate school. And so I know that's going to take up more of my time, right? You're running a time intensive uh, experiment in your lab that is going to take the entire week, and you know you'll be spending twice as much time in the lab that week than any other week. Balance would make you feel like you're not being successful in those moments. Integration realizes that that time is temporary and it's not forever. And then you keep working towards healthy um, sharing of those time periods. Cool. So moving from the idea of work-life uh, integration, we're going to actually talk about how we can prioritize uh, our time, right? And so we have a mindset. We have to now think about what comes next. And so there's a couple ways that you can prioritize the tasks that you're working on. Uh, and we'll talk about those. Now, what I'll stress at the beginning is that you need to find what works for you. So as we talk about a couple different techniques, some of these may work for you. Maybe you're working on them right now. Maybe you've never heard of them. I encourage you to try out new things. And then if it doesn't work, move on and find something new. And I cannot give you an opportunity to exist on exhaustive list or the perfect way to prioritize. Everybody's a unique individual. One that is particularly popular is Covey's prioritization matrix um, that you can read more about in his uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. If you want to go and get the book and dive all the way into Stephen Covey. Um, but what I like about the prioritization matrix is it's very good for very visual folks that need to have buckets as they're working on them to help them figure out their day. In the prioritization matrix, you really draw this out and it's encouraged that you actually practice this like on like a sheet of paper or digitally. And you basically map out uh, your tasks based on four categories, uh, based on their level of urgency. So how time sensitive is it? and their level of importance. So if you look at the top right-hand corner, you'll see the urgent and important box, right? These are things that have an impending deadline that if you fail that deadline, there are significant consequences. It's stuff you have to do. And so the things that you put at the top of your prioritization list, right? You do those now. Don't put them off. <clears throat> which seems really common sense, but in common practice, we often procrastinate these urgent and important tasks because they're the scariest, and we'll do something that's less important to feel like we're making progress, right? We'll procrastinate through productivity. So if you actually map it out and say, yep, this lab experiment is due at the end of the week, I need to have results, I need to work on that, you can prioritize that. If you move over to the left-hand side, things that are important, are not important, but urgent, uh, these are the things that you de delegate or do later, right? If you have a task that it's not important that you do it, but there is a time frame in which it has to be done, you need to find a way to fit that potentially into your schedule or delegate that out and have someone else work on it, right? If you're moving down to the second row, if you have things that are on the left-hand side, not urgent, but important, that's where you create a plan to get those things done, right? If you have just passed your proposal, 
and your thesis is a long way off, that is important, but it may not be the most urgent thing, right? Conducting research or a lit review or something else that goes into that may be the more important thing. So you, but you need to schedule out time to work on that so that it move, never moves out of the important but not urgent category, right? So you do those next, you plan those. The idea is you never let them rise up to the do now urgent and important category because you work on them piecemeal and get them chunked off before you run out of time. The last category is things uh, on the left-hand side bottom uh, that are not an urgent, they're not important. And these are the things you try to eliminate from your task list as much as you can, right? These are things that you may even do to feel productive, um, but they're not helping or contributing, right? So high point of stress, a lot of things on your task list, rather than start any one of them because they feel like too big a task, you scroll Instagram. That's not urgent, that's not important, right? So you gotta try to eliminate that. So you gotta figure out where everything fits. And so the, the idea behind this is that you actually take your tasks, everything you're working on, and you map it directly to the matrix and then move forward from there. For some folks, this is a bit too much. So they don't prefer to do this. Another example of what you can do to prioritize is called the MIT method. Not Massachusetts Institute of Technology, the most important task, right? And this can be really good for folks that like really concise lists and like to make sure they knock something big off their list every day, right? So the idea with this is it's very simple on the surface. Every morning you designate two or three things that are the most important tasks that you have to get done. And that's what you focus on. This is separate from your daily to-do lists, right? I need to pick up milk and do some laundry, uh, you know, pick up the kids from daycare, that is a list you may have things you need to do, but your most important task is separate. You can almost consider it sacred. Like I got this list, it's separate, I need to get it done. And then you work on those things first. Try to get them knocked on as early in the day as you possibly can. And give yourself artificial deadlines to encourage yourself to work on that and get it done. The thing with the, I, the MIT method is that to make this work, Okay, very deceptive on it's simple on the on the surface. And in practice, you have to be ruthlessly efficient in your task management for this to work. And you can't get to that point. So that's where you literally put down like these are the two or three things that I'm going to work on and get done. And I will box out other things to make sure that this gets done. Right? So this is where you close your office door and zero in. Cut other things from your to-do list that you don't need to do that day. So you have to be ruthlessly efficient in cutting things out to make sure these things get done. And once they're done, then you have the time to either look at other tasks or have some free time that you've earned. So another simpler method that you can go with. Moving from prioritization, I'm gonna take a quick check in the chat and make sure one's okay. Good. Okay. And again, if you have questions, if I'm moving too fast or something, please feel free to drop something in the chat or uh, ask questions in the room. I'd be happy to talk about any of those one things uh, as we go through. Uh, but the time management session is actually going to be pretty time efficient and move through pretty quickly. The uh, moving from now prioritization, again, it's two examples of how you can prioritize. There are many, many more. And again, I encourage you to try out some of these techniques. Find what works, stop doing what doesn't, and don't be afraid to try something new. Kind of my refrain through most of what we do in this session. Now we think about not just how we prioritize, but how we actually manage the time we have, right? I'm practicing the prioritization matrix that lets me know what I need to work on, how do I actually structure my time? The first step, and probably one of the simplest, is time blocking. And so this is where you schedule everything out for an entire day. 
and it does require some prep, right? And so you think about in the morning, eating your breakfast, going through, putting your tasks into your Covey's prioritization list, figure out what you need to do, and then mapping out what you need to do for the day and how you're blocking your time. <clears throat> so you schedule out what you would need to do. I actually have an example of this on the right-hand side. So in this example, someone is getting up at 8 a.m. They're doing their prep for about an hour while they're eating breakfast. So they figure out what they need to do for the day. There's class from 9 to 11. And then they're going to check email and go through their to-do list and check up, make sure they're making progress at 11 o'clock. And again, I encourage you to schedule in time to check your email, particularly your UTEP email, because you'll miss a huge amount of important communication if you aren't checking that regularly. Um, the example I will use is that, you know, last summer we issued uh, research funding to folks that were uh, moving towards graduation spring 2023 for doctoral education. We gave them funding specifically so they could take the summer and not have a research job, just focus on research. We want to make sure those folks finish their doctoral degree in September 20 or in uh, spring 2023, because we were moving on a counting cycle for our R1 status, right? More students than you would expect got the email or would have received the email and never responded to accept the funding simply because they don't check their UTIP email. This is free money that all you gotta do is read the email and check it. So schedule in time, make sure you check it. So this person's checking at 11 o'clock, they're scheduling in lunch, uh, giving us a full hour. There's an hour for dissertation editing, so that's in every day they're working on their dissertation. Good practice to be consistently working on that, small chunks at a time. They have more class from two o'clock to five o'clock, so a bigger chunk of class there. They have a registered student organization group meeting. I encourage you to be involved on campus. Join the graduate student assembly. Uh, Growing another student organization, or be something else that involves you in our campus. This could either be swapped out with going to the uh, rec center and working out. They're doing dinner at six. They're going to study for a midterm exam from seven to nine. Do about an hour of Netflix at the end of the day, and then they want to be in bed by ten o'clock. Now, will their day play out exactly like this? No, we're not robots. Things happen. But starting off walking at the beginning of the day and trying to be ruthlessly efficient to hold to that is going to help this person be more successful and have their time managed. And they're getting all their priorities checked off. I encourage you to look at doing something like this, scheduling out three to five days in advance of knowing when you're planning to do different things. You can always modify and change that but it gives you an idea of something to hold on to. This is when I expect to do these things. And when you think about this from a work-life integration standpoint, you also block in the things that you also need to do that are priorities as a human being. Put in here that you need to do laundry. Put in here that you need to spend time with family. Um, figure out where that needs to be. For some folks, time blocking will be really effective. Make sure it includes all the meals and personal time and everything else like that. Please don't skip meals, especially not effective uh, at helping you get things done by eating at your desk or something that or skipping lunch. Um, you're actually less effective in the afternoon to do those kind of things. Um, but the other thing that this will do is it also help you uh, discover and figure out where you're wasting time. So if you sit down and you actually map out everything you're going to do during the day, and then you follow up and you figure out, did I actually stick to that schedule? You'll figure out where you deviated and wasted some time. And then you can hopefully eliminate those. Another idea, so if your time blocking is not for you, it's a little too structured. And for some folks, it just is, and that's okay. You can go to a more in the moment uh, time management technique, right? And sometimes you can use time blocking and the Pomodoro, right? Those are things that you can work on. But this one's particularly interesting. Um, it's a pattern that allows you to work in chunks of time while also giving yourself break time so you are efficient during those work times. And for some individuals, this is very effective. Um, it's called Pomodoro because that's like little tomato in Italian. And the person that created the Pomodoro technique literally used it based off of a little tomato timer they had in their home, right? And so the idea is that you choose something you're working on and you set a timer for 25 minutes. And if you go on your phone 
onto the app store and you type in Pomodoro, you can find an app for this real quick if you want to. And it'll work you through the whole process, right? But you set that timer, 25 minutes. When that time expires, you take five minutes, you take a break and you protect that break, right? Even if you feel like I'm in a groove, I should finish. Nope, get up, stretch, get a snack, walk around, check your phone if you need to. The idea is that during that 25 minutes, you're not doing any of that. You're not distracted by a text or an email or checking Instagram, right? You are just focusing on work during that 25 minutes. And then those other distracted things you do during the five minutes. Then you reset your timer. You do another 25 minutes if you haven't finished the task. Focusing in on the task at hand for that 25 minutes. After four Pomodoros, which if you're playing along at home is two hours. Then you need to take a longer break, 15 to 30 minutes. Get up, do something else, watch TV, go for a run, do something, right? If you have a long, large task you're still working on, you can go back in and start doing more Pomodoros. But the idea is that if you spend too much time hyper-focusing, your attention trails off, you become less effective. So this is about hyper-focusing in those moments for the work, then taking a break, disengaging, working back into it. Right? For some folks, this is really effective. For other folks, ADHD folks like myself, not as effective, right? We struggle to get in on the task and then disengage and then get back on the task, and that's okay. Or we like to work on three different tasks at once, which multitasking is actually shown not to be effective. You can never really do it really well. But that's just how some people's brains work, and you got to be okay with that, right? You find your own way. Um, but this may be very interesting for you if you haven't tried it in the past. So that's just two time management techniques. There are a lot more. And so if you're looking through this and say, I'm already doing time blocking, I've already tried Pomodoro's, these things do not work for me. Go on to the Google machine, start looking and researching, try something else and see how it works for you. Try to apply those strategies. Yes. The Pomodoro, are there certain tasks that would say work better for it and work less well? Because that's, that's yeah. personally what I've found myself, but I can't quite figure out which are which. Yeah, that's a good question. I think it's going to be highly dependent on the individual. Mm -hmm. um, I found a lot of folks report that the Pomodoro is really good for their writing. Um, because, and we do this, you know, uh, we have our writing retreat uh, once a month, 8.30 to 2.30, you know what I mean? And we, we ask you, like, really focus on it. Don't have your email open. Don't use your phone, you know what I mean? Really trying to focus in. And it, it can be really hard for someone to, you know, put the phone all the way away or not check email and then know, is there something else going on I need to respond to, right? Um, and so this allows them that space to give themselves the permission to focus in for 25 minutes and not be checking to see if something's coming in by the email, right, and be distracted. So for writing, it's been a, a folks report that it's very effective, um, but other folks, not. Um, for working on, you know, uh, complex, like lab related things, uh, it could be really effective. But if your time frame in the lab dictates, you know, how long you need to be there, like you're running an experiment that runs 50 minutes, the Pomodoro taking better work, right? And that's okay, right? It's going to be highly dependent on you as the individual. Um, but also, the, you know, the fact that you've tried this is a good way you can test out and kind of map out. Yep, Pomodoro works good here. I'll use it here. But this other task that I have, I have to find something else. And what is it? Right? Is it possible to make a mix of them? Because I'm trying to check something out now. Uh, with COVID uh, metrics, mm -hmm. mixed with Pomodoro. Yes, you absolutely could. And I encourage you to have kind of like a scheme in your brain for your how you prioritize, and then a scheme in your brain for how you manage your time. Right? And so you might sit there and say like, yep, I use sit down in the morning <coughs> or a breakfast cereal and I draw out my grid and I write out and prioritize what I'm going to do, right? And my most important thing uh, I know I'm gonna work on in the morning and then I sit down to work on it and I start doing the Pomodoro technique to actually get it done. And so one is about planning and one is about action. So I encourage you to use both if you find them interesting. Check in the chat for any questions.
couple of good chats. Need to remove all wasted time. Yep. Yep. A more discipline. Uh, yes, Ed, the technique is very saucy. I see you. Accountability team. I also love this, uh, the idea of the accountability team. That's very, uh, can be very effective. Um, so yeah, I, that's a great suggestion of finding folks that can assist you in being accountable to what you're doing. So group study and things like that. That's actually part of, uh, I use the writing retreat a lot, I guess, in, in these examples of time management, but it is, again, it's pretty effective. We know that writing your dissertation can be really difficult and giving yourself permission to take an entire day to really devote to that sometimes feel uh, uh, difficult, like, well, can I give this up that much time? I have so many competing responsibilities. We sign up for an event where we say, come in, focus on it. Once you sign up, you need to be there. We're going to feed you lunch. Um, gives you some mental permission. But then in that room, you have all those other accountability buddies that are also working on it, right? And if no one else is looking at their phone or email, you feel less likely to do that. And so finding your folks that can hold you accountable is also really productive. Um, something that uh, one of our other uh, grad school folks uh, mentioned that I have not done, but um, was pretty neat, is that you can, if you can't have that study group or someone that you can meet regularly, you can go onto YouTube and you can find like four hour long, like study with a friend videos, which was fascinating to me. It was almost like the um, like idealization of like where you're studying because it's a very nice, like outdoor picturesque space, you know, almost like a cafe with nice nature in the background. Someone just just off camera, just kind of studying. And it's very quiet. And it's like there's someone else there with you. And just imagine somebody like in their apartments, hunkered down, you know what I mean? The weather's not great outside, but on the screen, everything's great, right? But and then after a certain time, like there's like a little like almost like a ding, and the person who's studying with you in the video gets up and goes off and does something else as the indication it's break time, right? Um, so as ways you can even find that accountability space, it's really fascinating in our, in our digital environment. Well, sometimes maybe even having the ability to go in and and have a, a space in person, right? If you're looking for just some general accountability, you can also go to the Grad Hub, uh, which is there on the third floor of the library. That's a space right here for graduate students that you can be in that space where you know other people are working and studying and just having them around you can immerse you in that academic culture and then that helps that accountability piece. Um, but I love that, it's a good comment. There's one more comment, Jesse. Okay, I'll go ahead and look at that. And then a uh, good comment on the Pomodoro. All right, cool. All right, so. Moving from time management, and we're gonna spend just a little bit of time on this, but productivity tools, right? Now, as I'm looking around at our folks in the room today, I see everybody's got a notebook open and a planner. They're taking notes, kind of working through, marking out what we're working on, right? This is very common. Folks have a planner of some kind. Uh, it's a productivity tool. We haven't thought of it in that way yet. Um, what I will say, and again, it's a refrain for all of this, is that you need to pick what works for you. What I've seen too commonly is folks will get entrenched in a certain idea of a productivity tool or an approach. They see everyone else doing and even if it doesn't work for them, they keep doing it over and over and over and over again. I'll be really honest, I am guilty of this. I've got a little planner thing that I take with me to every meeting that I jot notes down there. You know how often I go back and look at those notes? Never! And I've always been like that. It's never worked for me. I actually got out of the habit pre-COVID and moved over to a digital version that was much more successful. And then I never went back because when the digital space, it didn't work. And I have tried to get back into it, and I haven't yet. I need to. And maybe this session will be the thing that pushes me over the edge. But you gotta find what works for you, right? I recommend some kind of planner, but what does that look like? Is that a physical notebook that you go back and refer to? Maybe that's really functional. Maybe you pick out a specialized one that has organization for your notes and your plan times and everything else that you're working on. Uh, one of my colleagues who's very organized and really loves planners and to-do lists, she has her notebook where she takes notes in her planner. And then she also has a secondary planner that is a series of like different size sticky notes and different labelings on them where she can pull it out and make a quick list. And it was really fascinating. It was really cool. It's like a quick little thing she can use. And so she has different planners for different tasks, right? That works for you, run with it. 
If you're not someone who likes to write things down in that way, find something that does work. Um, if you want to be more digital, and this is actually where I found myself more successful versus the paper bound, was looking at something like OneNote, Evernote, or Google Keep. These are all basically digital notebooks. Now, what I found helpful for this personally is that instead of having just like one notebook where I just kept turning a page and adding for a meeting or something I was going on, I could basically have a notebook for everything I have as a working uh, document, right? And so when I would go to a committee meeting, I would have a running list for that meeting and go back and refer to, as opposed to it all kind of being disorganized. For me, that was more successful. Um, and I need to get back to doing that. But final works for you. If you need the hardbound, you need something physical, run with that. If you need something digital, run with that. If neither of those things are working, find out what does. That could be a wall calendar. It could be a whiteboard in your office that you keep all of your tasks on and you update regularly. As we talk about the Covey's matrix, we actually see a lot of folks will put that on their whiteboard and that's where their primary planet is on a whiteboard. So figure out something like that to keep you organized. You can also look at a task board. Again, this can be something that's physical, cork board, in your office, in your home, you know, if you do all your planning over the breakfast table, you have a cork board right in there where you're posting things up with a push pin and some notepads of what you're working on. It can also be digital though. Uh, there's products like Trello, which is free. It has a paid version, but there's a free version where you can create task lists. Um, if you didn't know in Microsoft Teams, which we all have uh, as uh, students and staff here at UTEP, they have a task board section, uh, which can get pretty advanced. And that can be a place where you can map out your different tasks and check them off as you do them. If you put in a bunch of tasks, it will also make a graph of them if you want to see it that way. So there's different ways you can look at it. But I encourage you to have something like that to give you that big picture look at what you're doing. Also, work on your digital calendar. And I really encourage you to use the Outlook calendar associated with your UTEP email. That way, when you're logged on, if you put things in there, it'll pop up alerts for you, let you know what's going on. You can invite other people. They can invite you to meetings. Everything that kind of is in one area. You could potentially really easily do all of your time blocking directly in that calendar. And you don't ever even have to do that as your like primary appointment calendar. You can create a secondary one and then have that be an overlay. As an example, in my current work, I send a lot of the emails that you all receive as graduate students. And those are mapped out over the entire semester. I have an overlay calendar called emails and deadlines that I click on and it tells me on any given day what email or what deadline is going on that I put in there. But it doesn't conflict with all of my appointments and things like that because it's an overlay, right? But put that stuff in. If you didn't have today's workshop in your Outlook calendar, my question is, why not? If you're in your email regularly and it would remind you it's there, that could be helpful. So as you plan things, put it in there because you have a lot on your plate, it's easy to forget. And as you work through all these different things, don't be afraid to try something new and then get rid of it if it's not helpful, right? If Jesse says, try OneNote, and you've always been a paper planner and you try OneNote for two weeks and you hate it, it's not working for you. Do something different, right? If you're currently a paper planner person because you see everyone else with one, um, at the beginning of the year, Jesse threw a minor guide at you when you were walking past and said, please use this, right? And you took it uh, and you've been holding on to it, never actually used it. If that's not for you, that's 100% okay. Find what is. You don't have to be productive like everybody else. Good ideas here. Set time boundaries with friends and family early. Uh, you know they'll need to devote time to family work and school if the minimum priority school is a finite period. Yep, absolutely. Task board sounds good since we get screen time burnout. Yep. Good idea to sync personal all calendar with work and school. I, I would say yes. Um, it is, and you can have you know an overlay calendar of your personal things and your your uh, professional and your, your work uh, as an academic. But you're going to want to have uh, something that uh, shows you your complete day. Um, but again, you can also have two different calendars. So if you want to have a personal calendar 
you can click on and off, um, that's not a bad idea. But you know, if you have a doctor's appointment coming up, and then you know you have a day where you're taking off a half day, you're not going to be on campus for a half a day because you have you know a commitment with family. Like being able to put that on your calendar so you can see it completely, I think would be really helpful. Because um, again, you're integrating what you do, right? So figure that out. Um, you can also color code those things. On my calendar, I've got everything's in you know blue because I like blue, except things that are programmed. So those are in yellow. So when I look at it, I can very easily see at a glance when I have professional level workshops I'm facilitating coming up, right? So it's good stuff. So last thing I want to talk about is stress management. Um, because again, all of these things we're talking about for prioritizing and time management and productivity tools, they will mean deadly squat if you are at such a high level of stress that you can't practice them effectively, right? And this is a chicken and egg situation of, does the time cause stress or am I stressed about the time, right? The answer to that question is yes. So you gotta find a way to manage your stress. Also knowing that stress is a natural part of being a human being. We also don't wanna look at this much like we did for time, uh, for uh, work-life balance, or we're trying to do an artificial sense of balance, there's no artificial sense of being stress-free, right? That's just not realistic. There are times when we'll be in lower stress, we're on vacation, up in Rio Doso, low stress, right? But you still have some stress, knowing that the emails are piling up in your inbox while you're away, right? Um, so stress is normal, it's a human thing, but how do we manage that effectively not let it reach to a point that it negatively impacts us, right? First is really maintaining a healthy sleep schedule and diet. You know, I've hinted at this and other things that we're doing uh, in the prioritization and time management. You need to put these bodily functions into what you do. You can't shortchange your sleep. You will not be productive, right? There are times where we get less sleep. That happens, right? We go through, we have a really, really busy day. We don't get home till 11 o'clock, but it's also premiere night for House of the Dragon. And so I'm gonna watch that and stay up an extra hour and lose a little bit of sleep. Yep, that happens, right? Um, but we can't consistently do that. We can't consistently stay up till 3 a.m. working on a project and up the next day at eight o'clock and expect to be productive, right? We will start to degrade. We can't routinely skip meals and expect that we are gonna be productive, right? Unless you specifically practice intermittent fasting, which is a whole different thing that you're practicing, but it does focus on actually taking your diet at a certain time. But make sure you're scheduling things in in a healthy way for yourself. Also knowing what your biorhythm is and how much sleep you need and when you prefer to sleep. I've had folks that they prefer to go to sleep at like one o'clock in the morning, but they slept in later. If your schedule accommodates that and that's your biorhythm, integration, what works best for you, the best time for everything, right? You can also look at things to help actively relieve your stress. Guided meditation can be one of those things. It's really easy to access. Go on YouTube, you can find a guided meditation. If you scan the QR code for CAPS resources, they have things right on there through CAPS to go. But find that out, right? You can look at mindfulness activities uh, that disengage and use a different part of your brain, right? That can be coloring for mindfulness. I do origami occasionally, uh, yoga, something that takes you and basically exercises a different part of your brain once you disengage from the stressful point can really be effective at then refocusing and being productive. Uh, and what you can hear, yoga and exercise. Uh, again, yoga could be a mindfulness exercise, a mindfulness activity. It can be a health activity, probably a bit of both, right? But you may find for you exercise in a different way is what helps you stay balanced. You go for a run, you hit the gym, go for a walk in nature, go on a hike, but do something to keep yourself active. Really important. And again, seeking out help when you know you need it. And maybe seeking out help before you're on fire, right? I have a link there again to CAPS resources. They have a lot of really good things that can help you. They have a page called caps to go that has on your own activities for when you're at higher levels of stress. Um, please know that CAPS also does crisis counseling and ongoing counseling. 
And so if you have that moment where you are in crisis, know that there's always help available to you, uh, whether it's during the day when you can go directly to CAPS or you call the after hours line, which is the same number for CAPS during the day, becomes the after hours line at night, you have that support. As students, part of your fees gives you access to the counselors at CAPS. And so if you haven't ever developed a relationship with a therapist outside of campus and you'd like to start therapy, you can go into an intake and start getting some sessions with the counselor here. I hesitate to say free of charge because you're paying for it through your fees, but and no out of pocket would be cost, right? And I often want to tell folks when you think about your mental health, think about this like you do hopefully your physical health. You go and get a checkup occasionally, right? You don't only go to the doctor when your leg is broken. You don't only go talk to a counselor when you're absolutely in crisis in your moment of uh, the biggest concern, right? Ongoing help. If we can tackle some of these things in our own well being and we manage our stress well, all the other things we're talking about with time management will get easier. So, as we close out and we'll move to questions, I want you all to remember that everything that you do takes time. Even adjusting how you're going to manage that time, right? So, this is a process. With that, I'll go to questions. Well, in the so over here, both in the digital space and in the room here. See here. Some comments about boundary setting, which is good. Football can be difficult because that's a priority, understandable. Ed agrees that Caps is an awesome and helpful team. That's correct. So, what questions do we have? In the room, online. I'm wondering how, I know a lot of people have said that before, how you can use exercise to manage your, what's the correlation between exercise and stress management? Sure. That's a good question. So, part of that is, you know, if you have that stress, like that nervous energy, right? Um, you can burn some of that off, um, it can help you sleep better. Um, it's a different, in just a way of like engaging your body in a different way. Um, and also if you engage in exercise regularly, you're overall going to be more healthy and less susceptible to stress, right? Uh, stress has also been shown to just break your body down. Uh, and so like, if you're in a high periods of stress for long periods of time, you're more likely to get sick, uh, feel under the weather, feel, uh, tired, um, and exercise has been shown to combat all those things. Uh, and so it's ways to, to balance that, right? But everybody also kind of exercises in their own way, right? For some folks, they may really enjoy going for a run every morning. I hate it. <laughs> I've been doing it. I go for a run like every morning, two miles. And every morning I talk to myself about, I really don't want to do this, but I go and do it anyway, right? Um, that's just what I'm doing for right now. Um, but you can find things that work for you, right? Um, and that could be just going for a walk, yoga, stretching, um, any of those things, or it can be more intense. Some folks like, I need to go in there and weightlift because the action of doing that really helps burn off the stress and allows me to just kind of push through, right? Whatever it is. And if you're like, yeah, I still don't really enjoy exercise, that's okay. Find something you do enjoy. But, but again, that would take some of your, some of your time if you're, especially if you're struggling with that. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's the challenge too, is that you only have so much time in a day, right? Um, but part of that, that integration and then caring for yourself sometimes is setting aside the time to say, as busy as I am, I matter. And so I'm gonna eat, I'm gonna sleep, I'm gonna go for a walk. Because without those things, um, I'm not gonna make it, right? It's uh, at uh, one point, uh, I read a joke or something like that, I described it as that, we're really just overcomplicated house plants, right? We need food, we need water, we need sunlight to survive. You take those things off the table, you will wither, right? And there's some truth to that. So treat yourself like an overcomplicated house plant. Food, water, get outside. Other questions or comments? We have some good love for Capster and people are gonna look into it. I'm glad that you're gonna look into it. 
Um, if you have questions on it, uh, you can also feel free. I'll drop my uh, email in the chat here. You can always feel free to email me. For folks in digital land, uh, I'll drop this right now. That's my email. So if you're wondering how to get involved with CAPS or anything we've talked about, you can always go to their website. Um, but I'm happy to help also uh, with that. I'm uh, pretty well connected with the staff over there. I do a lot of programming with them. They're good people. Any other questions? All right. Uh, with that, thank you very much. And everybody have a good day.